three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us today for our Clean Energy Lunch and Learn. We have some amazing panelists here to talk with us uh, about some of their research and their science that they do. Um, we're going to be using Slido to take any questions that you may have or get any responses from you guys. So if you guys have a chance, please log on to www.slido.com with the event code CEI underscore lunch. So I'll give you guys a chance minute to do that. And so before we get started with our panelists, I just want to tell you guys, so we're part of the Clean Energy Institute. And so the Clean Energy Institute is a foundation at UW, the University of Washington, whose mission is to accelerate the adoption of a scalable clean energy future that will improve the health and economy of our state, nation, and the world. And so what a scalable clean energy future for us means is we're focusing on research that has three main pillars. We're looking at solar energy, so solar panels and solar cells um, that'll convert light energy into electricity. We're looking at energy storage. So we're looking at a lot of different kinds of batteries so we can take that energy and store it for future use. And then we're looking at energy systems, which is also called the grid. And so that's how we get energy from one place to another. And so our research focuses on all these different pillars. And so for today, we have a lot of different exciting things going on with you guys. We'll be, we'll be uh, breaking up, talking with our panelists with some fun activities and some fun video demos. And so our, um, so our first activity is we have actually a guessing game for you guys. So we have these four images and we would love for you guys to take a guess at what they are. And so these images are really zoomed in we are, they were taken using something called a scanning electron microscope, an SEM. And so if you guys have any guesses, please log on to the Slido and using the event code CEI underscore lunch and give us a guess. I'll give you guys a few minutes and I can give you guys some hints while we're, uh, while we're waiting for some responses. We can see things, um, some of these things are biological, even the things that like aren't biological might be. Ooh, we have one guess that B is from a palm tree. And we have a guess from that C is a rolling pin. These are really great guesses. Oh, we have a guess that A is a sea urchin. Those are those little fun uh, uh, creatures that are like all pokey. <laughs> okay. And just ooh, another, another guess that B is a palm tree. It really does look like a palm tree, doesn't it? But I'm actually gonna give you, I guess that was a hint already that maybe it's not a palm tree. Ooh, C is guess as a fiber optic cable. Another guess for D is skin cell. That's a cool, that's a good idea, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and reveal the answers. So A, is actually the eye of a fruit fly. Who knew people like, eyes are so like pointy? So if you look at the, there's a really small, actually there's a terrible, terribly small scale bar from here to here. So that's 25 microns. That's about the so right. So this distance is about the quarter of the width of a human hair. And then, oh, we have some other guesses that A is hair and B is hair. B is actually a, the picture of an artificial feather. So feathers zoomed in apparently look like palm trees. Then C is the tip of a mechanical pencil. So this is what the lead of your pencil looks like when you zoom in really closely. And D is actually algae. So the kinds of things that you see in the ocean that turn things green. And so you guys had some really great guesses. Thanks you all for guessing. Um, and now we're gonna go ahead and move to our panelists. So each of our panelists is gonna give a brief introduction about who they are and what their science is. And we're gonna start with Christian. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Christian Pedersen. I am a fourth year graduate student here in the University of Washington in the physics department. 
a little bit about uh, the science or research that I do uh, is all about trying to develop a next generation computer that we call a quantum computer. So just as computers allowed us to solve problems that you would never want to do or could not do by pen and pencil, uh, quantum computers can solve problems that classical computers, which are all the ones in your cell phones and your laptops and your desktops, quantum computers can solve problems that even they can't solve. Um, and most excitingly, a lot of this is going to be problems in material science. So right now, it's very difficult for a computer to predict what the material properties of a certain substance are going to be. Is it going to be electrically conductive? Is it going to be suitable for a solar panel? Can we use it to convert visible light into electrical energy? Um, and quantum computers are actually able to uh, predict uh, from a fundamental perspective what the material properties will be. So uh, the type of quantum computer we work with uh, is based on diamond. So we buy these little uh, square pieces of diamond that are ultra high purity. We uh, create these sort of molecules inside the diamond, uh, which are essentially the working part of the computer. They're the memory of our computer. And then we go through this very complicated fabrication process to end up with really, really, really tiny devices. So on the right, if you remember the, the, the eye was 25 microns across, this image is also the exact same scale. It's 25 microns across or one quarter the width of a human hair. Uh, and you can see there's these little gold electrodes on our diamond. And also there are these cool structures uh, whose purpose is to essentially guide and control the way that light behaves. Um, and so we work on, all of this is done by graduate students. So we buy our diamond, but after that, all of the steps, all of the design process, the fabrication and the testing are all done by graduate students. Uh, when I'm not in lab uh, trying to get these things to work, uh, I uh, live in Seattle with my fiance. Um, and some of the things that have helped me get through COVID and, and through grad school, I really enjoy music. This is a picture of me playing French horn. Um, I also really enjoy both the cooking and consuming of food. So this is just a little uh, dish that I that I cooked a little a little back. And I also really love to travel. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, that's been very difficult. So uh, my fiance and I uh, uh, went to San Juan Islands off the coast of Washington, and we stayed off uh, in a little boat Airbnb. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about myself. Thanks, Christian. And so our next speaker, our next panelist is going to be Wenchi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Wenchi. We're happy to see you here. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And my research area is in, in the power system with high penetration of renewable energy sources. The function of power systems is basically transmits the electricity from the generation to the uh, demands, including the residential, the commercial, and the industries. This is an area that is highly relevant to our everyday life. I think, yeah, almost all of you have experienced the power outage for several hours every year. And one extreme example is that what happens in Texas this February. More than 4 million people lose their access to the electricity for over one day. And several of them even lost of the loss of their lives in the extreme cold weather event. So our goal is to avoid this kind of large accidents. Or at least we want to reduce the proportion of people who will lose access to the electricity, or we want to reduce the duration of this power outage. So in our research, we try to do this by optimizing the operation and control for the systems. This is the open and exciting area. And back to myself, a fun fact about me is that yeah, in my PhD experience of two years, I actually spent almost one and a half year at home. Yeah, so sounds like a fake PhD, right? But uh, this uh, experience is actually enjoyable. Because yeah, we can work better to balance our lives and our and our academic life. I like cooking, yeah, and here she's a figure of some baking I made recently. And uh, I also like some other activities, yeah, such as the hiking or kayaks, this kind of uh, stuff. And also, yeah, although we are in the COVID, we are not totally isolated with the friends. 
And usually, yeah, when we are free, we like do some board games like the Texas Hold'em, the, uh, the Canva, yeah, this kind of stuff. And we may also, yeah, do some barbecue or having some dishes together. So that has really formed uh, and make our PhD life very colorful and enjoyable. Yeah, so that is a brief introduction of me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wenchi. And our last panelist, last but not least, is Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm a third year graduate student in the chemistry department. And so my research is on nanoparticles. And so nanoparticles are materials that are between one and 100 nanometers in length. And you could see on this scale bar uh, for perspective where you have a tennis ball that's a couple of centimeters. And then as you start moving uh, down the line, you can see an ant, and then you could see where a human hair is on uh, this graph. And then nanoparticles are more than a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair. So they're really, really small. And what's really cool about these is when you think about the wavelength of visible light, visible light is also a couple of hundred nanometers. And so the fact that these nanoparticles are really similar in size to the wavelength of visible light, they have really interesting uh, properties when they interact with light and they absorb and emit light very efficiently. So this bottom left picture, this is a picture of some nanoparticles in uh, like a solution. And then there's a laser pointer being pointed through the solution. And so you could see that they are glowing as the laser pointer passes through. And nanoparticles are also called quantum dots. So maybe you've heard that before when you've heard there are a couple of TVs that use uh, quantum dots and nanoparticles as part of the color display. And so you could get really pure color uh, out of these TVs. But they are also, nanoparticles are also used in uh, solar panels, so to make solar panels more efficient. And they're also used in medical imaging and a lot of different applications. But uh, when I'm not in lab, I really enjoy spending time outside. So there's a picture of me hiking over near Leavenworth. And I also enjoy kayaking. So that is a picture taken off of my kayak in Lake Washington. And I also really enjoy playing board games. So I included a couple of pictures of some of my favorite board games, uh, Terraforming Mars and Clank. So um, that's generally how I spend most of my time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. Maybe Kelly and Wenchi can play board games together. <laughs> awesome. So now we're going to take a little break from our speakers um, and give you guys, show you guys a, some, a liquid nitrogen demo. And so let me stop sharing for one second. Let me close this and get our demo video ready for you. Okay. And now you may need to turn up your volume just a little bit. Today I'm going to be doing a demonstration with liquid nitrogen. Oops. And liquid nitrogen is really cold, so I need to put on some safety gear. But in the meantime, can you guys guess the three most commonly used units of temperature? And you can go ahead and submit your responses in the Slido. So the three most commonly used units of temperature are degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, and Kelvin. So here, inside of here, I have some liquid nitrogen. And so this is a special container that helps keep the liquid nitrogen cold. And I'm going to pour it into this other container that works just like a coffee thermos.
Liquid nitrogen has a boiling point of minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about minus 196 degrees Celsius. And then finally, in Kelvin, liquid nitrogen has a boiling point of 77 Kelvin. I have this balloon. I have this balloon and I'm going to put it into the liquid nitrogen. In the Slido, can you guess what's going to happen to the balloon when I put it in? As you saw, the balloon deflated, but then once I took it out and it started to warm back up, it started to inflate again. And this is because pressure and temperature are directly proportional, so as the temperature dropped, the pressure also dropped and the balloon deflated. But then once the balloon warmed back up, then the pressure increased again, and then it looked like the balloon inflated. Awesome job. I was watching the Slido and it looks like we had some excellent guesses. People knew what the, um, the three major units of temperature were. We had some fun guesses for the, what the balloon was going to happen. No one actually guessed the right answer though. It was pretty surprising. So let me go ahead and share my screen again. Okay. And so now we're going to go ahead and go back to our panelists. And we're going to talk about some of their pathway to how they became a scientist and maybe some of the challenges they had along the way. And so our first speaker is going to be, oops, our first speaker is going to be Wen Chi. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, as I have seen before, my major is in the power systems. Then how do we get there? Yeah, uh, firstly, it begins in the middle school from the uh, physics class. Yeah, when I learned about the circles in the physics class, I guess uh, many of you have uh, also got experience in doing the experiment of lighting the bulb by building your own circles. I found this process is very interesting. And then I also got a set of toys that is yeah, play with the modules in the circles and we can use that to realize some different functions. I found that really in interesting and exciting. So I choose the electrical engineering as my undergraduate major. But then how do I get, uh, how do I get from the broader sense of the electrical engineering to the power systems? The beginning is kind of superficial. It is the school tour to a power system operator. Uh, th uh, this kind of operator can be understand as a brand for the operation of the power systems. So yeah, it can be showing the middle figure. They can monitor the status of the whole power systems in this big screen, and they make important decisions on deciding the operation mode of the power systems. So I feel like they look like kind of the hero that yeah, determine how the city can get access to the electricity. And after that, yeah, I got to learn about some interesting topics such as yeah, what is what if the power system have 100% of renewable energy sources? And what if our life uh, become more smart? That is, we may have more smart devices we can control, and we may have more smart meters. Then in this sense, what how life will be and how can we optimize our devices to actively participate in the operation of the power systems? So yeah, when I went to graduate school, I choose the power system as my area and then things become in even more interesting because the power system are becoming more smart in the way that we have more smart meters and more smart devices. 
So that means we will have more data available for the real-time control. Then in this process, machine learning will play a very key role in efficiently use of this data. So my current research is to combine the physical pride of the power systems with the machine learning technologies to enhance the stable operation of the power systems. So thank you. Thank you so much, Wenqi. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, then our next speaker is going to be Christian. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, back when I was in high school, I actually, middle school, high school, I didn't even realize that I was interested in science. Uh, and I was also not particularly uh, good at or interested in mathematics. And I only took, I almost didn't take physics at all in high school. It wasn't until my junior year where I was in a chemistry class. And I had always kind of assumed that, you know, science just sort of made sense. Uh, and it was just all very logic based. Uh, but when they were describing the structure of the atom, I realized that I was completely, completely wrong and that the world of the very small is very, very different from the reality that we live in. Um, and it almost seems magical and amazing uh, how, how different atoms behave from like a tennis ball or a baseball. Uh, and so that was kind of where I got started was uh, once I learned about that, I, I sort of just started to look up as much as I could. And um, I ended up having to do a lot of self-studying because I was too late to take physics in the traditional way. Um, and so I did a lot of self-studying um, and ended up applying for college uh, in physics. Uh, when I was in undergrad, uh, the first year was incredible. I was, you know, meeting all of these new people and, you know, learning all of this cool new physics. Uh, and then my sophomore year, uh, it got a lot harder. Um, I wasn't meeting as many people. I wasn't being as social. And my classes got really, really hard. Um, and to the point that I was really wondering, like, is this where I'm supposed to be? You know, am I smart enough to be doing this? Am I going to, you know, am I, am I in the right place? Um, and uh, fortunately, I had just lots of friends in the physics department to help me do homework. This is my fiance and I sort of uh, occupying a room and, and getting our homework done and studying for finals. Um, and I realized sort of that I loved it so much that I was going to have to persevere because I was where I was meant to be. Um, and so I ended up deciding uh, at the end, I, my favorite part was all of the lab classes I took. So uh, I decided to be an experimentalist when I went into graduate, uh, when I got into graduate school. Um, my favorite thing was optics because you can see it all in front of you. Everything is visible uh, for the most part. Um, and so I decided that I was going to combine the two things, optics, and the original thing that got me into physics, which was like single atoms. So if you remember, I mentioned that I, I studied single atoms inside diamond. Um, and so that's kind of how I chose my research. But I will say that it was very difficult when you're applying to grad school, you can do research in almost anything. Um, and so you have to really fight like anything you want to research, you can find a school and you can do that kind of research. Um, so it was very difficult to decide what I want to do. Um, but I love the idea of working with my hands, doing optics, being able to like design and fabricate devices was a really attractive thing for me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a little bit about my journey. Thanks, Christian. We are glad that you persevered so you can align those lasers. And now our last speaker is Kelly. Hi there. So when I started um, high school, I really thought that I was not going to go into science. I honestly didn't think that I liked science because previously, really my only experience was um, some biology classes I had taken through middle school and at the beginning of high school. And so I thought that I was going to take a completely different trajectory than being in science. But then uh, my sophomore year in high school, I actually took my first chemistry class and it was really inspiring. Um, my teacher was really great and she was able to explain things really clearly, but I really liked how chemistry had a little bit of math. So it is analytical and you could, you know, just crunch some numbers and come to the right conclusions. But I also really liked how, uh, I truly think that chemistry is really beautiful. And that's because everywhere that you look, all of the things around you have different chemical interactions. And so I really found a kind of beauty and artistry within chemistry and the mix between math and all of the different physical interactions. 
And so then I decided to pursue chemistry in undergrad. So I grew up in Texas in San Antonio, and then I went to college at the University of Texas in Austin, so still not too far away from home. And there I started doing some research in a lab there where I had a graduate student mentor, and I had some really phenomenal lab mates uh, that really got me passionate about research. And that pass passion for research was probably my um, the most persistent driving force throughout my college career, because there were definitely some parts of college that I didn't like. A couple of classes were really hard and similar to Christian. There are definitely um, some struggles that I encountered. Um, I failed one of my first chemistry tests, which was kind of hard to really stomach. But then after kind of going back to the drawing board and coming up with some new uh, study methods and really just finding a study group and talking to professors, I was able to get through all of my classes um, with a lot of success. And so between my classes and my research experience, that really inspired me to go to graduate school. And so then I moved all the way up to Washington, which is very far away from where I grew up. And I actually drove all the way from San Antonio up to Seattle. And so I did that with my husband and we made a really nice vacation out of it, stopped at a couple of national parks. And now uh, in Seattle, I really love it. Uh, this is a picture that we took at Discovery Park. And I've really enjoyed my research so far. And the thing that I enjoy most about graduate school is really being able to explore my own research ideas. And so just having the freedom to pursue things that are really interesting to me and having the resources to do so. So that's how I ended up at UW. Awesome. Sounds like a really fun road trip, Kelly. And so now um, we're gonna have another activity, but I also wanna take a moment to remind you guys, feel free to um, ask questions throughout. We probably won't answer them until the very end, but feel free to throw questions into our Slido as you think of them. And we promise we'll get to them at the end. Um, and just so you remember, it's slido.com with CEI underscore lunch is our uh, event code. And so now I'm going to, we have a fun demo. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and Christian can go ahead and start talking as I prepare our video. Awesome. So yeah, so today I'm gonna to be showing you uh, a little bit about uh, one of the common tools that's used in physics, chemistry, biology, it's ubiquitous. Uh, we're talking about lasers. Uh, now lasers are a very special form of light that have a variety of really unique properties. Uh, but some of the most obvious are that uh, they tend to be very beautiful colors. Uh, they tend to be very directional. They travel in collimated beams for very long distances. Uh, and also they turn out to be very, very bright. And uh, you can go all the way from, I can barely see that to, I shouldn't even be in the same room without eye protection. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you lasers that are in our lab uh, that are also in the, I need to wear uh, eye protection when I'm in the room with this laser. And uh, the reason, there's a variety of reasons why you might need lasers that are that powerful. One of the interesting things I'm gonna show you is that some lasers are actually not electrically powered. You don't plug them into a wall. They're actually powered by other lasers. So you have to take a really, really powerful laser beam and send them through your laser and you get a laser of a different color usually. Um, and so uh, you're gonna see, we're gonna go from infrared light to green light, from green light to red light, and then from red light to blue light, which is the actual laser that's used in uh, these types of experiments. Uh, and so you start off with really, really powerful lasers. Uh, you're gonna see, I'm gonna burn something just by putting it into the beam. Uh, and then we'll see how it loses its power as you, every time you try to do one of these conversions, you lose power. So if Maria would like to start the video. Yeah, notice the walls that we have built around. This is all normally in an enclosed box. And Maria is gonna insert an index card into our green beam path for just a few seconds. And there it is, it's smoking. So you can see that it actually just burned a hole straight through the index card. <laughs> Uh, which is, again, why you need to wear eye protection. Uh, the power of this is about 10 watts, which is way, way, way more than you could ever get in a laser point or anything like that. Uh, and so this is all, the IR has already been converted to green lights by the time you see it here. It goes through these boxes, 
uh, each of these boxes will convert it to a different uh, color of laser range. Um, and you can see on the back side of the table, you can see that now it is a red laser beam. Now, this laser beam is about 100 milliwatts. It's about 100 times more powerful than a laser pointer that you would use for a presentation. Uh, so it's still very dangerous, even though it's not nearly as bright as that green laser. And then it finally goes through this last box where the color is converted from red to blue. Uh, it's almost UV light. Um, and so we sometimes have to play these kind of games in order to get the exact wavelength that we want for the types of experiments that we do. But yes, always wear laser safety goggles. Thanks, Christian. That was a lot of fun. I actually helped make that video with him last night in lab. <laughs> OK, let me prepare to share my screen again. And so now we're going to get to our last sec uh, panelist question, which is what is your day to day life like? What do you do every day? Um, and also I want to, rem again, remind our um, our audience members, feel free to ask questions in our Slido because I, after the section, we're going to be going to questions from the audience. And so our first speaker in this section is going to be Kelly. So uh, my day to day actually varies a lot uh, depending on what I need to do for the week, but I really like the variety that I get out of my work. So on the left, I'm showing that some days I am making nanoparticles. And so this whole setup, um, it's a very specialized kind of reaction setup. And this is because the nanoparticles uh, that we make, you actually have to synthesize them in the absence of oxygen. And so this whole setup is so that we can remove all of the air and water um, from our reaction flask and so then it's just pure nitrogen without any oxygen. And so uh, typically it takes me uh, three to four hours to make some nanoparticles and then another two to three hours to kind of like finish up the reaction and to uh, get my nanoparticles in their final state. So some days this takes me all day and this is what I do. But then once I make the nanoparticles, uh, another thing that I spend a lot of time doing is to measure the uh, properties that are resultant from making them. And so here, uh, the picture in the back, this is a very large superconducting magnet. So sometimes we put our nanoparticles inside of a, ma uh, a magnetic field, and then we measure them while they're inside the magnet to see how their optical properties change with the application of the magnetic field. And then also um, some other times we're using lasers to probe our nanoparticles. So either to see, um, to characterize the luminescence that comes out of them, or we can also do some time resolved experiments. So we can see how the optical properties of the nanoparticles change as a function of time. And we could get to really uh, short time windows. So all the way down to nanoseconds and uh, which is one times 10 to the minus nine seconds. And so uh, we could go even a little bit faster than that, but that's our most routine. And so then some days I'm sitting down in our basement uh, laser lab, and typically it's lots of time with the lights off. So sitting in a dark basement is also how I spend some of my time. But then at the very end, uh, to really understand the results of these experiments, we have to analyze it. So then taking all of the data that we have collected and then working it up so that it's plotted in a way that makes sense to us. And then we really spend some time thinking about the results that we have and sometimes fitting the, the results that we have to certain um, theoretical equations and really just spending a lot of time collaborating and talking about our results and kind of starting the process all over again. And then just doing that iteratively until we have a really complete picture of the nanoparticles that we're working with. So I think the, the favorite, my favorite thing about my day to day is how much variety there is. And my least favorite thing is probably washing all of the glassware for when I'm making my nanoparticles because it feels a lot like just doing dishes in the kitchen. So it kind of feels like a chore, but that is my typical day to day. Awesome. I love the pictures of your lab. It looks a little dirty, but a little bit clean. We'll see. <laughs> okay. 
our next panelist is Christian. All right. So uh, just like Kelly said, I think the best part about grad school is uh, there's so much variety in what you're doing. It changes from day to day, week to week, month to month. So it's always a very interesting job. Um, I'll just highlight two of the big things that I spend a lot of time doing. So one is I kind of mentioned before that I work with a microscope. So again, if you remember how small the devices are, you cannot, you can barely see them by eye uh, and only if there's a lot of them next to each other. Um, so we have to use these special microscopes that uh, we build, that we design, build uh, from scratch. Uh, and uh, this is an artsy photo of the microscope with cool lighting. Um, but the special thing about this microscope is that we can take pictures of single atoms. So uh, this is a, a, an image from this microscope that I'm showing. And basically, this is a, an image of the surface of very close to the surface of diamond. And each of these little bright specks is a single one of these little atoms on the right. It's a nitrogen atom uh, next to a vacancy in the, the diamond crystal. Um, and so under normal situations, you can actually never take a picture of an atom using an optical microscope because you always have so many atoms next to each other that uh, you can't resolve what's one atom and what's the next atom. But in our uh, diamond is a transparent material and our atoms are the only thing that fluoresce. So it's sort of like looking at uh, a fluorescent thing in, in the vacuum. Um, and so this is kind of where we study the properties of these things to make sure that they're going to be suitable for a quantum computer. Um, and so uh, it turns out that if you want to image a single atom, your diamond needs to be really, really clean. So like Kelly mentioned, there's a lot of cleaning that happens. Um, and you have to make sure that your microscope is really well aligned because a single atom is really not that bright. And you need to collect all of the light that's emitted or as much of the light as you can from these atoms if you want to be able to see them. Uh, but the other part of the work that also takes a lot of time is I work in the clean room. So uh, because our devices are so small and you're doing these fabrication steps, you can't afford to have dust in the air because a single piece of dust can wipe out 10 of your devices. Uh, and so we work in a clean room where we have to wear these white uh, sort of jumpsuits. You wear a mask over your face, uh, you have to wear glasses. Um, and it's a very, very clean in there. And uh, we do all of the different steps of making the devices as well as looking at the devices to make sure that the sizes are right, that everything is as we expect it to be. Uh, so on this bottom right picture, one of the steps is that we actually sort of etch our structures into the diamond. And diamond is so uh, resistant to, uh, to acids that basically the only way that you can etch diamond is using plasma. Uh, so uh, this red image is actually an oxygen plasma inside of a chamber where our, our sample is sitting. And the, the plasma etches away the diamond, except for regions that we put a protective layer over. And so that's actually how we, we fabricate those structures. Uh, my least favorite thing is uh, dropping diamonds. Again, they're transparent. So uh, trying to find uh, a nearly invisible object on a dirty floor is uh, a huge pain. Um, but I would say overall, getting a picture of a single atom is worth it. Thanks, Christian. Maybe you'll start a new fashion trend with the clean room suits. And now our last speaker, Wenqi. Hi, everyone. Happy to share my day-to-day -day life. And actually, my life is also very flexible and kind of depends on deadline. Yeah, the guidelines including the papers, the exams, the courses, and some other activities. And yeah, here I first like to talk about the academic life. I find the, the right picture is quite interesting. Yeah, that describes several modes when we have, yeah, in our research and our academic life. Yeah, and uh, normally when we have got a new idea, we really quite, got quite excited about that. Wow, that's kind of a very huge, uh, Huge discovery, but in this process, when we try to get deeper in that, we will talk with our advisors, with our collaborators, and when we know about them, it's very common that these ideas is actually not quite meaningful, or they uh, have already been realized by some other people, and uh, that even though we get uh, ideas that can be implemented, really in this process. It's also very common to get stuck in some challenges, and it may take us for several weeks or even several months. But every time uh, uh, when we overcome this challenge, the, accompli uh, the, the accomplishment is actually very, very huge. 
And in this process, when we overcome this challenge, we will build the confidence in our research. And I think that is the most happiness part for the PhD life. And uh, here back to my daily life, uh, as I have said before, my research is on the uh, power systems combined with some machine learning techniques. So the main focus of my research will combine the modeling based on the physics of the power systems, the so proving some of some math theorems, and uh, uh, also the computer programming to realize these ideas. So uh, uh, that also uh, uh, makes my daily life, yeah, that will focus on mainly one of the, uh, those parts. And for our researchers, yeah, we can imagine that it will cover their knowledge about physics, the methods, the computer sciences. So in this process, they're uh, talking with different people, such as the advisors, the collaborators, our lab mates. It's very important to get us to know deeper about the main knowledge, and they may also help us to overcome some uh, difficulties in different areas. And uh, as I have seen before, yeah, we may stuck in some problems. So yeah, in this case, we may choose to relax ourselves by doing some sports and uh, yeah, focusing on some hobbies. For me, yeah, it's kind of cooking. Oh yeah, just hang out with the friends. So that will make our lives to be more powerful and enjoyable. Yeah, so that is kind of the, the, the life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wenchi. It sounds like you spent a lot of time talking to people, actually. <laughs> Scientists all, don't all hide in the lab. <laughs> okay, and so now it's our exciting part. It's time for audience questions. And we have some great questions in the chat, in our, in our Slido. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Okay, and so let's see. One of our first questions is, um, what is undergrad? And I'm gonna go ahead and throw this one to, let's start with Kelly. Yeah, that's a really good question. Sorry that sometimes we use like little nicknames for things, but undergrad is kind of just shorthand for college. So typically what you would think of for like a four-year degree. So undergraduate studies is something that uh, people pursue in college. And then uh, after undergraduate, then you can go to graduate school. So it's kind of just a way to differentiate kind of your, your first part of your schooling in college versus now we're PhD students in graduate school. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Um, along that same line, there was one more question about how is uh, graduate school different than undergraduate? Is it expensive? Is it a long time? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and maybe throw this question first to when she, but then anyone else can also jump in afterwards. Yeah, uh, 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 I think the biggest difference between the yeah, graduate school and other graduate school is that we will transition from the people who uh, who uh, be being taught the knowledge to the role to yeah we create some knowledge yeah or we create some new techniques yeah so in this process we will know how to identify the key problems in, in our research. And we will gradually know how can we, yeah, split the challenges into different parts and we can overcome it step by step. So in this process, uh, we will be the dom dominant, uh, dominant role to do all of these kind of jobs. Although we have, yeah, our advisors, our lab mates, they will also help us a lot. But in this process, we will, yeah, have, uh, yeah, uh, we will have great freedom to explore what we want to do, and we we need to get good schedule to do whatever, we, uh, yeah, to, to 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 reach the goal we want to get. So I think, yeah, that is a big difference because for the undergraduate school, yeah, uh, our courses are kind of yeah have been scheduled by some other people. So what we need to do is just to learn something people taught to us. So yeah, so I think the graduate school, yeah, it's kind of 
more interesting because we have more freedom to do whatever we want, want to do, that to, to explore what's, what we want to do in research. Yeah. And I can just add for length, I think it usually varies between four and six years for graduate school. Uh, it can be a little bit longer. Uh, and uh, for money, at, at least in, in experimental science, you typically get paid in graduate school, unlike undergrad, you're typically being paid to do research. Um, so uh, like I'm not paying to be in graduate school, essentially. Um, and other people, if they don't, if they're not like working in a lab, they usually get paid for being a, 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 a teaching assistant. So you'll be in like, let's say uh, an intro physics class for undergraduates, and you're doing the grading of the homeworks, grading of the exams, and sometimes leading uh, leading the actual classes. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that we typically don't have to take out any loans to go to graduate school for programs like we're in. So the university covers our tuition and then we get a like a salary on top of that. So graduate school is a lot closer to what you would think of as like a full-time professional job and our hours reflect that as well. So instead of undergraduate uh, in college, where maybe you have a lot of breaks throughout your day between classes, we typically, you know, show up and work full days uh, at work, but we get compensated appropriately. So that's really cool. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Uh, now we're going to change gears a little bit. We had a lot of questions about lasers in our Slido. Um, and so Christian, and then also I think Kelly, I think you work with lasers also a little bit. So um, maybe our first question can go to Christian and it'll be, how big and how hot can lasers get? So that's a, a really great question. Uh, and actually there's, this is one of the things that's special about lasers. So it turns out if you try focusing light from the sun down to a point, there's sort of a law of thermodynamics that says that you can never focus the light to a spot that is hotter than the sun. So you could say that the sun has a, the light of the, from the sun has a certain temperature and it's basically the temperature of the sun. Lasers are, are a different beast. Uh, in principle, there's actually no limit to how bright you can make a laser. So I actually did the math for if you were to, if it, is it worse to look at the sun or to put my eye under the objective of my, of my microscope? It is so much worse to put your eye in a laser beam than it is to look at the sun uh, for, for most powers, uh, because you can, depending on how much electrical power you want to put in, you can make a beam that's that powerful. And so they even have, you know, lasers that are whole facilities where they can get to just extreme power densities uh, of laser beams. So there's sort of no limit. Uh, people are always trying to get more and more powerful laser beams. Awesome. We also had some great ideas in our Slido about lasers. Um, and so again, either one of you guys, anyone can answer this one. So can you store power from solar panels, then transfer them to lasers, then across, uh, then across a distance into batteries using the laser to transfer the power. Kind of a cool, cool idea. Maybe I could repeat it again because it was a kind of a lot of steps there. Can you store power from solar panels then transfer the power to lasers and then across a distance to batteries? So we use a laser as a transfer mechanism for the power. I can take part of this. Uh... So 100%, you can totally do that. You, definitely, you can take energy from a solar power, use that to control, a uh, to power a laser and have the laser uh, do that. It turns out that lasers are not super great for energy transfer in that way. I mean, it's you can burn a piece of paper, but traditionally, if you have a large amount of power, you want to send it um, through electrical wires uh, rather than using lasers to transmit power. Lasers are much better for transmitting information. So that's why uh, lasers are used in fiber optics to send signals. Uh, but traditionally, if we're doing power transfer, it's usually better to use electrical, electrical wires. Excellent. And then we had... Yeah, I... oh, yeah so, sorry. Yeah, he, he, yeah, here I also think that is a pretty interesting question. Yeah, and uh, uh, actually the wireless power transfer is a, a very active research area yeah, nowadays. And uh, yeah, and as far as I know, people will do this by the uh, magnetic fields. Yeah, the, the transition from the electric field to the magnetic field. And the magnetics can be done yeah, wirelessly. 
So yeah, that that make it possible yeah to transfer the power yeah without the, the the electrical wires. Yeah, one example is yeah in in our mobile phone, it is already possible. Yeah, we can charge our mobile phone without the charging lines. Yeah, but if we want to transmit larger power, like from the solar panel, yeah, that, that is more difficult because the yeah, power is so huge. But people already are doing this. And I think, yeah, in the near future, we can see the application of this kind of interesting thing. That's really cool. Awesome, Wenji. Thanks for that like interesting application that I didn't even know about. <laughs> Sweet. And then we had one more question about lasers is, is there a material that cannot get burned by a strong, by that strong laser? So I guess it's more about materials. So there definitely, it depends on the range of laser and the material that you're using, but there are a lot of materials that can withstand that kind of laser power. And you could think about it practically, like when we're in the lab and we have these lasers running, we wanna make sure that wherever the laser ends up doesn't just start burning holes through the wall. So we do have materials that just are really efficient at absorbing all of that laser power so that you don't get that kind of, um, kind of safety issue in the lab. So no lightsabers that are gonna break through everything. <laughs> okay. And now we're going to change gears a little bit. We had one more question kind of about career paths type of stuff. And so uh, what do you want to do after you graduate? That's almost sometimes a little bit of a scary question for graduate students, I know. Um, but uh, maybe everyone can give a quick little answer to this one. Uh, maybe we can start with Wenji. Yeah, I think that is yeah very key question. Yeah, every graduate student will consider from the beginning of their area yeah, to the last year. And for me, I think, yeah, I would prefer to go to academia because I find research is interesting. But yeah, I will also yeah, got an internship this summer. And I think, yeah, that will help me to understand better about the industry and the academia. And possibly, yeah, it's also common for us to change our mind while we, yeah, in the high grade. So yeah, just keep thinking about them. And I think all of the tries are good. I'll mention that, um, so after graduate school, I'm interested in continuing to pursue research, but I think that I would like to do that more in kind of an industrial setting rather than an academic setting. So, um, you don't have to be at a university in order to do research. There are a lot of companies that uh, do their own research. And so I think I'm particularly interested in that so that then being in an environment with a very specific goal and being able to see a product all the way from understanding how to develop it all the way through to seeing it on the, the market. So you can also pursue research in a lot of different contexts. Yeah, my answer is similar to Kelly's. I'm also interested in after graduate school, sort of doing research in an industrial type setting. There's a lot of companies that are are getting interested in quantum computers. So I think I think it would be nice to kind of continue along the same line. But people are trying to make quantum computers out of many different materials. So it's very likely that even if I was working in the same field, I'd be doing something completely different. Cool. Um, and I'll just like to mention, so people mentioned here um, academia or academic research and versus industry research. And so when people say academia, what they mean is research done at schools, so like universities. So if you're doing research at a university or a national lab, you often don't have a product goal. And so um, that's, what that's what academia or academic research means. As opposed to industry research is you're working for a company. And so you often have like a product or a specific goal. Um, and another, another goal is to make money for the company. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for that question. Um, and I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. And so let's see. What about, um, we have a question for Wenchi. Can you briefly mention what is machine learning?
yeah, machine learning is yeah actually very a uh, broad area. And uh, in my understanding, it generally refers to, yeah, we use data to help us to make some decisions or, yeah, or, or realize some tasks. Yeah, uh, uh, for example, yeah, in the uh, image classification, that is a very, yeah, uh, uh, very hard application area of the machine learning. Yeah, uh, we may have the data sets that consist of, yeah, the dogs or cats, yeah, or other kinds of animals, for example. But when we face new images we have never seen before, then how can we yeah, automatically identify uh, which object it is in the images? Then that is what machine learning do to, yeah, to kind of learn from the data of the data set we have already known to identify some kind of things we do not know, but without the, uh, uh, the, the activity of human here. So as we can imagine, if we can yeah, do all of this uh, total automatically, then uh, we can e uh, eliminate a lot of efforts of humans. So that will make our lives more easier. Yeah, so, and uh, the, uh, this is just a very simple application. And now, yeah, we may know more about, yeah, uh, we want our vehicles to automatically drive itself. So yeah, in that sense, how, how can we identify the objective uh, objects in the traffic is very key area. And yeah, without the uh, human brain, so the machine doing this requires a lot of design and algorithms, a lot of optimizations to do these tasks. Yeah, so that is a very fascinating area. Cool. So we can have computers do my homework for me, maybe. <laughs> awesome. And so uh, maybe our last question for today is gonna go to Kelly. So how does the liquid nitrogen you showed us, how does it relate to your research or to CEI? So uh, generally the CEI, um, as Maria started with, there are a lot of different kind of sections of research that we're interested in, but a really big overarching um, kind of goal is to understand materials and how we can develop materials either for solar panels or for batteries or even like Christian really efficient novel kind of computers. And so part of understanding these materials is to understand how they behave across a wide range of temperatures. So you can think that solar panels get really hot when they're sitting out in the sun. So we need to understand how the properties change as the solar panels get hot. But it's also really important to know how materials behave when they're cold. So a lot of these really efficient computers or like the nanoparticles or the for the TV displays, they become a lot more efficient when they're cooled down. And so just having a really um, robust understanding of how these materials behave across a wide range of temperatures is really important to the, a lot of the applications in the CEI. Cool, literally cool. <laughs> um, and then we had one last audience member question. Um, how long are semesters there? Um, and actually maybe I can answer this one. So, uh, so we're actually on the quarter system. And so quarters are about, uh, there's four quarters in a year and each one is about three months long. And so we have autumn quarter um, that goes from like September to December. Then we have winter quarter, goes from January to March. And then we have uh, spring quarter, which goes from March until like June. And then we have summer quarter. Awesome. And I think that was all of our questions for today. Um, and so thank you everyone so much for uh, coming to listen and listening with us and learning about our scientists. Thank you so much for our panelists for taking the time out of their busy science schedules to come talk with everybody. And a special shout out to uh, Monroe Elementary School who had some excellent questions. Um, thank you guys so much for asking us so many things. Um, and with that, um, feel free to, if you missed anything, if you joined late, um, we are, we're gonna be uploading this to our YouTube channel, or I think it's gonna, or it's gonna be saved on YouTube. So feel free to watch it again later. And also join us next week. We're gonna be having um, a whole different set of panelists, also interesting clean energy scientists to um, 
uh, watch and learn more about different types of science that happens here at the Clean Energy Institute. Um, thank you everyone so much. Okay, and the stream is done.